What is up, theology nerds? This is Trip, and today on the podcast is Andrew Sung Park. That's right, professor of theology at, and ethics in the lovely city of Dayton, Ohio. He is on the podcast talking about God and suffering. This is the second of eight conversations around God that are uh, all lined up right here for you. Mm-hmm. Last week we talked to Roger Olson about God's self-limitation. Today, Andrew Sung Park on um, the suffering of God, God's participation in all the crosses of history. And uh, then next week we're going to get to talk to Schubert Ogden, then maybe Catherine Keller, Walter Brueggemann. Just, just know this series is going to be amazing. You can find out about all eight of them. You can uh, sign up to be invited and join each live stream so you can ask some questions all at unfoldingtheology.com. And when you're there, you can find out about the coolest single theology event of all of 2016. Um, we're hosting it here at the Hatchery, where I'm Director of Theology and the Humanities. Philip Clayton and I are emceeing, and it's going to be an interactive, constructive theology workshop. Basically, we're going to talk about God with four amazing speakers. Keith Ward, uh, Cynthia Rigsby, Adam Clark, and Amy Shung. So... Uh, we're going to talk it up. And there's other stuff that's going to happen. Like, we're going to have a coloring book, an adult coloring book for theology. We're going to have um, some theological speed dating. We're going to have an interactive timeline of church history. We're going to have a guided beer tour around Los Angeles. We're going to have – well, I can't tell you everything because this is just an introduction to set up for the fact that you're about to hear Andrew Sung Park. And when you do and you're saying to yourself, how do I get more of Andrew Sung Park? Well, you can listen to his old interview on the podcast from a few years back. You can also check out From Hurt to Healing. One of his books, Triune Atonement, that one, The Wounded Heart of God. And I'll have some uh, linky links at homebrewedchristianity.com, particularly on this page. Uh, I'll link it up, and you can uh, go, go check out the text. Um, as we're uh, hopping in to this new year and this podcast, I just want to say thank you for all the people in the homebrewed Christianity community who uh, keep this uh, this this whole podcast going. Uh, they give every month. They're part of our little uh, secret conversational nerd sharing Facebook group, and um, uh, and then the elders and the bishops. They're part of our epic read series. And this month we're introducing Plato, the philosopher, followed by a walk through Plato's Republic, kind of like the most influential political text of all time. So we're going to do that. Then we're going to do some Augustine, then some Elizabeth Johnson, then some Whitehead. All that's headed in the next few months on Epic Reads. So thank you all for joining. Thank you for supporting. Thank you for being part of it. And uh, for those of you who want to support the podcast, want to be a part of the community, then just head to homebrewedcommunity.com to find out more details. If you live in the Bay Area, I'm going to be up there February 4th and 5th on the 4th at the Graduate Theological Union. On the 5th, hanging out with my friend Rick Mixon, pastor at First Baptist in Palo Alto, uh, the one and only good Dr. Daniel Kirk. And we're going to be live streaming our conversation on the clobber passages. That's right. Clobbercast at the GTU. It's invited, open to all. You just got to sign up. It's brand new, spanking, homebrewed Christianity pint glasses being filled by Heretic Brewing Company. That's right, Jamil Zanishev, the like multiple Ninkasi Award winner home brewer. If you know what that is, he started a brewery. It's called Heretic. It's freaking awesome. They're making the beer. Going to be at the GTU, the Berkeley, California. You should come. Yeah. Then we got to Enfolding Theology in Mark, March. At the end of February is PYM, Progressive Youth Ministry. I'm going to be there. Going to talk some. Going to speak some. I'm going to do a live podcast. Catherine Keller's going to be there. Rob Bell's going to be there. And the day before it, I'll be at the Southern Methodist University Perkins School of Theology doing a one-day theology nerd boot camp with Jorg Rieger on Jesus. So if you're in Texas, there's absolutely no reason not to spend the day with Jorg Rieger and I. Like, really, there's not because... Your Rieger's awesome. Jesus is freaking awesome. And we'll nerd out about Jesus all day and then go to a local craft beverage dispensary and talk about the Holy Spirits. Mm -hmm. I'm going to be in North Carolina in April. Yep. Myers Park Baptist Church. They just got a new senior minister, Ben Boswell. That's right. Campbell University alum. We were, we were like in Baptist Student Union together. Religion philosophy majors. We 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 have stories we could tell about each other that we're not going to tell. And um, he's our new senior minister. And then and Christy, who's uh, their their uh, education minister, she went to Wake Forest University Divinity School with me. 
So I'm just super pumped about getting to go there. It's like one of the most amazing historic liberal Baptist churches. It's in Charlotte. And I'm planning a lot of other stuff in North Carolina around it in, sh- in April. So if you're there, want to make sure we connect and such. Holla, holla. All right. Now, does God suffer? You want to know the answer to the question? I know I do. All right, well, hello, everybody, and welcome to session two of the Unfolding Theology series on God. I mean, it, it, we apparently did not cover every question and resolve every issue with God last week with Roger Olson. So today, you're going to get to hear from one of my favorite theologians, Andrew Sung Park. Um, if you have never read Andrew Sung Park before, then you're, you were just here for a treat. Uh, he has one of the coolest uh, books introducing uh, the Trinity, uh, Triune Atonement. And in it, he uses the Trinity and some uh, a, a theology of the cross that, recal- that wrestles with uh, suffering, even expanding some of the work people like uh, Moltmann have done into uh, addressing ecological concerns. And then uh, one of my favorite, most recommended books ever right here is uh, From Hurt to Healing, A Theology of the Wounded. And I'm sure we're going to end up talking about it uh, 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 during the Q&A if it doesn't come up in his initial thoughts because uh, the way he differentiates the difference between wounds and he develops a concept of Han and sin and how God deals with guilt versus shame, the victim versus the violator. He unpacks it and the biblical narratives throughout, and it's just uh, been uh, some really powerful work. Um, and not only that, it's in sec- chapter four of my dissertation, so um, – <laughs> the, the, you, you know, you know, someone really likes something or hates it if it's in their dissertation, and uh, uh, and, and Doctor Parks in the uh, I love it. I wanted a really good reason to read it all and and write about it. So, um, as part of the God series, we're we're featuring eight different thinkers, and it's all leading uh, uh, throughout January and February, and then the first week in March. We have a, an, a, an event here at the Hatchery where Philip Clayton and I are going to be in, emceeing an interactive uh, conversation around God. So you can find out information about uh, the event, the first week of March, and each of the uh, live sessions um, at enfoldingtheology.com. Uh, so uh, it, it, before we before we just jump straight into what uh, Dr. Dr. Park has prepared, um, I just want you to know that, uh, that if, if you're sitting here and this is your first time uh, wrestling with um, the questions surrounding the doctrine of God with... Um, a professional theologian uh, that uh, don't don't get intimidated. I talked to someone that was their first time last week, and they said by the end they felt like they were developing some sea legs at wrestling with these questions that are intimately personal, but with critical, faithful reflection, and it's just new. So one of the things we're hoping to do with uh, the series is expand the number of people in the church uh, who are, are, are learning how to think faithfully and critically about God and their faith around questions like uh, evil and suffering and divine revelation, religious pluralism and science and all this type of stuff. Uh, because one of the coolest parts, I think, uh, about our situation today is that you don't have to be in graduate school taking on lots of debt, studying and reading all the time to be able to encounter some of the best ideas uh, and, and the best thinkers. And today you get to hear from one of my favorites, Andrew Sung Park, professor at United Theological Seminary. So why don't, before you jump in, just tell us a little bit about yourself, the school you work at, and the, your favorite part about getting to work with uh, students in divinity school. Uh, first of all, I was born in Korea, and I came to the United States about 40 years ago. And I studied at Claremont. Later, I joined the Claremont faculty. And 20, about 24 years ago, I moved from California to Dayton, Ohio. This is one of our Methodist schools, United Theological Seminary. And this is a very unique uh, one of our 13 Methodist seminaries. The reason this belongs to EUB, Evangelical United Brethren Church. So it's the only EUB church which merged uh, with a Methodist church, which became United Methodist Church. And one cool thing is this. This school was established by Bishop Milton Wright, who was father of uh, two brothers who created an airplane. And 
So this is a very wonderful school where I am. Also, it has a, a tradition of a German pietism. It was a German speaking school in the past. Uh, it's very cool. And I really enjoy teaching students because I can learn from them. I just usually do not lecture that much. I dialogue from the beginning to end almost. Of course, some uh, important matters I have to lecture. So I like, have, I like to have a, a dialogue a session than just a lecturing purely. Mm -hmm. uh, anything else? I, did I miss anything? No, no, no. I think that's a, a great introduction. So uh, one of the things that we prompted each of the people that are joining us is to tell us the questions that are about God they wrestle most with and their students do, and then um, offer uh, a, a response from your own uh, theological perspective. So without further ado, Andrew Sung Park is going to tell us and answer the question, can we experience a living God and can God suffer? Yeah. And I'm going to focus on... Uh whether God can suffer that issue first. And that will, I think, consume 30 minutes. After that, maybe we can talk a little bit more about living God. My students, they really focus on these two issues. One is a God of a compassion. The other one is a, a God of a, a living. And whether God is a truly you know, active or is a completely transcendent or dead. Can you hear me all right? I can hear you great. Okay, good. Excellent. So now I'm going to just uh, read this uh, uh, my uh, article, The God of a Compassion Manuscript. Uh, I hope <laughs> I do not read badly. After that, uh, you can raise questions and we're going to talk about different issues. Okay, this is a part of uh, my own struggle. My own struggle, I have to tell you about uh, my family. My family uh, lived in North Korea. And then after the independence of, of Korea uh, from Japan, we moved to North, north from North to South. And we just travel all over the South by walking because of a war, Korean war. And because of that, uh, our family experienced deep agony and deep pain. So, and out of that passion, suffering, I focused on my study on this issue of passion and compassion. So our image of God is very critical in our daily life. It our conscious and unconscious, unconscious realm. Our social structures are related to our understandings of God. For that reason, any change in oppress, oppressive social structures involves a transformation of our religious consciousness. One could argue that religious categories that dominate our thinking are rooted in our understandings of God as one who is all, all powerful and incapable of suffering. The hierarchical order of our Saint Thomas' great chain of being is God, angels, and demons, and then man, woman, animals, plants, and earth. So the order of a divine social hierarchy of America may be God, angels, White men, white women, and white children, ethnic minority men, ethnic minority women, ethnic minority children, animals, plants, and dirt. Consciously, unconsciously, many people subscribe such theological social order. These categories are neither the only way one might think about God nor are they biblical in character. Such a conscious or subconscious hierarchy related to the image of God can produce lots of pain for lots of people. Under this kind of a social religious assistance, so many women, children, and the marginalized have been subjugated and violated, abused, and put down. 
If such unjust subjugation, violence, abuse, and dehumanization continue, sometimes generation after generation, their victims developed ineffable and indescribable pain. That pain is called Han in Korean. Han may be compared to the black hole phenomenon when a star that is uh, several times bigger than our sun becomes a red giant. It eventually reaches a point beyond which it cannot expand. The inner core of a star explodes, creating a supernova and star collapses. The distortion of time and space at the center created by the resulting gravitational force is called a black hole. Swallowing everything and swallowing everything it touches. The gravity created an even observes light. In a similar way, when a victim's pain expands beyond his or her capacity for perseverance, the soul collapses into deep, dark abyss. That abysmal core of pain is hard. The collapsed inner core swallows everything, dominating the victim's life agenda. The hope that is at the very foundation of our existence is frustrated, turned into psychosomatic thrashing, sadness, despair, resentment, and helplessness. This complex set of reactions so typical of those who are abused and exploited is a common experience of women who are mistreated, abused, and abandoned by lovers or husbands. Their dignity and self-respect are trampled and their souls broken. When their part patriarchal culture reinforces their broken heart again, that deepens their harm and may explode their harm. Han is a frozen energy. When Han is not treated and left unattended, it may explode negatively. It can take revenge, kill, and destroy. If it is attended and cared for, Han can be used constructively as an energy to forgive perpetrators, feel others' pain, and work for their healing. The relationship between Han and Sin is complex and cyclical. Sin causes Han, and Han can in turn produce Sin, overlapping in many tragic areas of life. The unresolved cycle leads to an intractable, darker state of affairs that may be called evil. In general, Sin is committed by perpetrators, and Han is experienced by their victims. The sin of oppressors may cause a chain reaction via the harm of oppressed. Through the Christian point of view, the problem of the sin and harm, indivisible in their relationship to one another, must be discussed, treated together. For 2,000 years, the church has paid a great deal of attention to the spiritual well being of the sinners or perpetrators, while generally ignoring the sin against. As a result, our vocabulary is dominated by the doctrine of repentance, forgiveness, justification, sanctification, and salvation. But there is a little in Christian theology that is addressed to the plight of the victim. This is the reason why the implications for our understanding of God are significant. We think of the cross of Jesus as the emblem of forgiveness and redemption, but we scarcely acknowledge its significance as the piercing suffering of God as a victim. The cross in turn becomes the critical turning point in the salvific relation between God and humankind. Classical theism and Christian orthodox, orthodoxy have a long held that God cannot suffer. A conviction arises out of the Greek notion that perfection excludes the possibility of a suffering and change. Relying on Plato and Aristotle, early Christians concluded God is therefore both impassable and immutable. 
during the Greco-Roman era, there are two traditions that particularly facilitated to form the church's doctrine of impassibility. One was a Stoicism, the other was a Gnosticism. Stoicism held that all reality is material. The highest being in this philosophy is the Logos, which is a universal reason or the divine mind. Our human reason gives us an affinity with a cosmic reason that ties the universe. It cannot suffer because the suffering means imperfection. The Logos, because it, it is a perfect, does not need to change from one state to another. It is nothing but contemplate itself. For this reason, the ideal state for the Stoic is one of apathy, life without the feeling or movement. The Logos really already enjoys the perfect state of non-violence, non-involvement. Narcissism was a religious and philosophical movement of the late Hellenistic and early Christian eras. It's uh, based on a dualistic view of a universe. Spirit is good, matter is evil. For that reason, according to Gnostics, the God who created this universe is evil. It is not surprising that the Gnostics deny the goodness of a creation, the positive aspect of a bodily life, and the physical incarnation of the divine. Only secret knowledge could save humankind from the prisons of our bodies and physical world. According to the Gnostics, this world, the material cosmos, is a result of a, a primordial error on the part of the supra-cosmic, the primitive divine being, usually called the Sophia, wisdom, or simply the Logos. This being is described as a final emanation of a divine hierarchy called the Pleroma, or fullness, at the head of which resides the Supreme God, the one beyond the being. It was in this philosophical and religious climate, Christianity emerged to proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ, the incarnation of the divine. The writer of a John's Gospel jolted the Hellenistic world, declaring the Logos has become flesh. There are two Greek terms used to describe the physical body. One is a soma, which refers to the body. The other is a sars, or the flesh which stresses the same rhythm, lost rhythm character of life. Over against the Stoics and the Gnostics, the fourth evangelist announced that the Logos has taken on thoughts. That was a shocking news. The proclamation was preposterous to Stoics and Gnostics and others. The incarnation of the Logos was its betrayal to its own nature and the suicide of the once stumbled Logos. The aloof Greek Logos becomes a, a concrete historical God. The in, impassable being suffers within our flesh for us. And as the Logos was in Jesus, the divine spirit is going to be in us. That was a true good news to the early Christians. In spite of this, the church condemned the idea of a God's suffering as a heresy. In the early third century, Sabellius argued that God the Father was born and suffered and died in the life of Jesus, arguing that God won, God is one, not three persons in one. The Sabellius or Patri Hessianist argued the doctrine of the Trinity was unnecessary. Drawing on Stoic philosophy, the church theologian Tertullian argued against him and argued for the doctrine of the Trinity. Actually, he coined the term Trinity, but he defended his argument by contending that God the Father was impassable and could not suffer. For Anselm of Canterbury, 
He said, God has compassion, and God has a feeling of compassion toward us. But in reality, that's only figurative speech in God's own reality. God cannot feel any, anything. It's a Greek philosophy. The following Aristotle, uh, Aristotle Thomas Aquinas contended God's mercy is an outcome of uh, God's action toward the sinners. God does not feel sorrow over the misery of others. Well, against the orthodox notion of the impassibility of God, contemporary theologians led by Jürgen Moltmann have, have begun to speak of God's suffering. For Moltmann, a man who experiences helplessness, a man who suffers because of he loves, because he loves, a man who can die is therefore a richer being than an omnipotent God who cannot suffer, cannot love, cannot die. This emphasis introduces a new logic. Rather than argue if God suffers, God is not perfect, Moltmann is arguing if God cannot suffer, God is not perfect. Divine suffering has nothing to do with deficiency. God suffers because of a law that is too strong to be apathetic for the human suffering. No power in the universe makes God vulnerable, but a victim's suffering, a victim's harm breaks God's heart, generating God's harm. That's the crux of a Jesus event. The in, invulnerable God became vulnerable in Jesus Christ. Is God all powerful then? There are two positions. One is a classical view that affirms God's almightiness. The other one is a view of a process theology that denies almightiness. God's almightiness is the essential belief of the monotheism and Christian theism. In them, God is perfect and unbound in power. God's almightiness denotes God is a sovereign over all other powers and that no power can frustrate God. God's omnipotence is not a simple matter. However, it may signify that God can do all things under all circumstances, even in logically contradictory situations. It may mean that God can do all things provided they are congruent with the divine nature and the principles that arise out of that nature. Or it could mean that God can do all things under certain circumstances. In addition, Christian theists have argued that God is capable of self-limitation as evidence in the creation, incarnation, and crucifixion. For process theologians, however, God is not almighty. For Whitehead, God is innately limited in power, the power that God has its power of persuasion. The power that God has is the power of persuasion and influence. God does not exercise that power unilaterally, but uses it relationally, luring us to maximize each given moment. In addition, he argues that God not only influences us, but it's also influenced by us. Just how complex and complicated our notions of divine power are become, becomes apparent, apparent as we begin to confront the issue. In his book, Why I Am Not a Christian, uh, Bertrand Russell criticizes the church because it worships power, not God. The one who does is a savage who feels the oppression of his impotence before the power of nature, but having in himself nothing that he respects more than power. He's willing to prostrate himself before his God without inquiring whether they are worthy of his worship. According to Russell, people deny but believe in their heart that the naked power 
that is worthy of worship. Russell charges that human beings created God all powerful and all good and mystic unity of what is and what should be. For him, the worship of a power to which Carlyle, Nietzsche, and the creed of a militarism have accustomed us is the result of our failure to maintain our own ideals against a hostile universe. It is itself a prostrate submission to evil, a sacrifice of our best to Mola. It is true that many of us have worshipped the power in the name of honoring God. However, if we worship God because of God's almightiness, the God we serve is not our Christian God, but an idol. Serving such a God indicates that if God is a not powerful, we might trample and despise the divine. This really happened at the event of the crucifixion of Jesus. In Russell's eyes, Christians are power mongers because they serve the Almighty God. The question haunts us then do we worship God or power? There are two kinds of power according to uh, Bernie Newman. One includes elements of a coercion, one-sidedness, control, dominance, independence, aloofness, or uniformity. The other involves persuasion, neutrality, relationship, respect, interdependence, solidarity, and integrity. The former is a menacing power that makes people fearful, frozen in actualizing their gifts. The latter is the authentic power that enables the people to maximize their potential at their own pace while retaining their own identity. God's power is a genuine power, or to put it another way, God is strong rather than powerful. And that strength is a based on truthfulness, not force. Hence, the name of God says, I am that I am. In John 18, 1 through 6, when a group of people led by Iscariot Judas came to arrest Jesus, Jesus asked, Whom do you seek? No sooner do they respond than he answered, I am he, Abel, Amy. Using I am God's name, Jesus defined the all-powerful nature of God. This is a truthfulness to death. Before the truthfulness of his assertion, the mob of a coercive power steps back and fell down to the ground. The Gospels writer also repeatedly used the phrase, I am, to depict the life of Jesus. I am the bread of life, I am the resurrection and life. In the Garden of Gethsemane, he did not run away from evil, but faced it with a truthfulness in spite of the fact that this confrontation cost his life. His life was marked by the full presence of a truthfulness and that the truthfulness was a, was a strength. God seems not to be all powerful, but is surely all powerful in truthfulness. In spite of a mockery, contempt, beatings, death threat, Jesus was a truthful. The confession that God was wounded in history reflects God's strength. The God in the life of Jesus is anguished yet truthful, gentle yet strong, broken yet whole, wounded yet healing. The truthfulness of God is much more meaningful than the traditional understanding of all controlling powerfulness. The divinity of Jesus is not a matter of indifference in this connection. The eyes, in the eyes of most Jewish people, the very notion of Jesus' divinity violates the first commandment. 
you shall not have no other God before me. To me, however, Jesus was a full of an essential nature of God. Only transparent to God, Jesus was truly united to God, in this sense, was divine. As such, the incarnation guards against speculative images of God, the worship of the power, the possibility of idolatry. In the face of evil, when God does not handle world events with a remote control that is involved in human suffering, sorrow, and grief, enduring the evil consequences of our sin. According to Mortimer, God's suffering arises out of love for the Son. True, God suffered on the cross not only out of a love for Jesus, but also out of a love for all crucified people as well. The cross represents God's full participation in their harm, and in turn, the harm of every victim, whether Christians or not, is a emblematic of God's crucifixion. The cross of Jesus nakedly exposes the brokenheartedness and woundedness of God, generating a deep harm in God. It is not only the insignia of God's effort to save humanity, but it is also the mark of God's inexpressible harm that is shared with all victims. Our sin injured, harm suffering God is a God of crying out for justice and healing. When God cannot bear the pain of injustice, God implodes and collapses into a divine black hole. That black hole is the abyss of God's wounded heart. The cross epitomizes the heart of God. On the cross, God and Jesus show how to resolve the harm in a constructive way. The words of Jesus underline God's own need for salvation. Eloi, Eloi, Abba Sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? True, the statement, God needs salvation, sounds absurd and blasphemous. But salvation means health, soundness, and welfare. It is a healing of the ruptured relationships, the improvement of the broken relationships, and the celebration of the restored relationships. If we understand salvation as relational, one cannot save oneself. Since sin and harm estrange humans from humans and humans from God, salvation means reconnecting the estranged parties. This is not a unilateral act, but it involves a relational reality. God's harm cannot be resolved by God's self, but by human responses. Enmeshed, enmeshed together, in this cosmic drama of salvation, neither God nor we ourselves can enter salvation or Sabbath through repose alone. Even God will not and cannot do so alone. The cross is a symbol of God's involvement in the massive process of saving both humans and God's self. St. Augustine said, Thou made us but ourself, and our heart is restless until it repose in thee. In turn, God, my sin, I have made you, my heart is restless until your heart finds your repose in me. This understanding is vividly illustrated in the parable of the prodigal son. When the second son walked out with his portion of the inheritance, he broke his father's heart. Day and night, the father waited for the return of his lost son. Until he returned, the father was restless, sorrowful, and anguished. In this parable, Jesus pictured God who is bruised and broken in heart by the sinful. Until the lost son comes home, God's mind and body are nailed to the cross. Such God is our God of compassion. I see God's almightiness here. 
what is all-powerful in compassion. This understanding of God is not without precedent. The exiled prophet, second Isaiah, portrays God as a woman in labor. Quote, for a long time, I have held my peace. I have kept still and restrained myself. Now I will cry out like a woman in labor. I will gasp and pant, unquote. Isaiah 42, 42. In the midst of a turmoil unleashed by the ancient empires, God shares in the adversity and darkness of Israel. And as long as Israel bears the heavy yoke of the Babylonians, God is restrained. But when that time of a strained silence is over, God cries out like a woman in birth pangs. This cry reverberates the profound hand of God and is the voice of the one who suffered with the people and craves for salvation. In this metaphor, we see promise and hope as well as pain. A new life coming out of a chaotic birth pangs. Since God is groaning, gasping, panting with us for salvation, there rises the vision of hope for humanity in the compassion of God. Our God is not a loved one who does not want to prevent the evil, but the passionate one who endures unbearable evil as a victim. Not because God is not powerful enough, but because God is strong enough to love, forgive, and embrace the sin, and to uplift, encourage, and heal the sin against. The cross is still more. It is a protest of God against perpetrators. It is a disclosure of a God's hand erupting in the middle of a history, serving notice on all those who exercise close to the power. Enough is enough. It is a God crying out against the abuse of the power and the unjust violation against God. It is a symbol of the victims wailing for justice from the death of the harm. When we gaze at the cross, Jesus from the perspective of abuse, it signifies God's suffering with him. When we see it from the perpetrator's perspective, it denotes God's suffering at their hands. The God who becomes our friend and assumes our own flesh announces an end to the idolatrous image of the almighty, almighty controlling God. This authentic face of God will bring forth the true meaning of power transform the repressively hierarchical totem of our society. God as our wounded advocate does not endorse any hierarchical institutions, gender discrimination, racial totem poles, exploitation, and abuse. God as a truthfulness and compassion attends to the wounds of those who have been unjustly abused, victimized, and oppressed. Jesus, as the incarnate, changes the image of all-powerful, changeless, impassable, and unilateral God into those of the truthful, wounded, relational, and compassionate God. No longer bound to abstractions, we need not conjure up the misleading attributes of God anymore. Through the life of Jesus, we see the true face of God. The Jesus event introduces us to the biblical God who suffered with us and within us. As a result, God bears a deep wound and seeks a salvation that is intimately linked to our own. In such a deep sharing of God's destiny with us, we find the ultimate yes to life. 
in spite of the depth of a ton of sorrow, grief, distress, heartache, anguish, depression, and despair, our weary heart relax, rest, and rejoice in God's almighty, truthfulness, compassionate heart. Those wounds are our sources of healing, joy, and hope. In this wounded, broken-hearted, yet truthful and compassionate God, we find the courage to face evil and brave our tomorrow. All right. Thank you so, so much. That was, that was powerful. Um, Thank you. Thank you. I, I really appreciate it, and um, and I'm glad I'm glad you wrote it out so that you we didn't miss uh, I- any of the, any of the thoughts. It was, uh, uh, it, yeah. So I, I'm thinking one of the things that might be uh, helpful and in kind of initially uh, jumping in is to say a bit about how your students normally respond, right? Like what you're saying if you're if you and I were talking about it. Um, we've been thinking around these ideas for a long time. Um, we, we've been grateful for Moltmann the, since the first time we read him. We have really appreciated Whitehead reformulating, you know, metaphysically the idea of God. Uh, so there's a whole big conversation. But for a lot of people whose uh, image of God and understanding of God is formed by their uh, the, their worship, the liturgy, hymns, and uh, engaging scripture with kind of Tertullian's assumptions intact. Uh, mm-hmm. What are the what are kind of the normal hangups or questions that that your students kind of first respond with that you, that you have to address before they can really um, sink their legs down into this uh, in, into a God who got all the way in the sarks of things. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's a very good question. Um, my students, most of my students, they are very evangelical and conservative here. So if I say God is not almighty, and students, they do not hear anything more. So I have to really uh, share the biblical foundation first, as I did here. And also, I want to really redefine meaning of almightiness. Mm-hmm. God is almighty. I do not deny that. God is almighty in power, but that power as a second one, as a burning rumor said, as a power of love, power of care, not power of control. And so when I mentioned about the just a few different types of powers, then they understand this issue much better. They, they think almightiness is not that uh, power to control others. It's a uh, more power to maximize others' potential and to heal others, to help others. Nobody denies that. So I try to go slowly on this issue. I don't want to force anything. Slowly uh, check the biblical foundations of uh, almightiness. Mm-hmm. Yeah, people, uh, I think it takes it quite well. So, so far, I haven't had any kind of a strong resistance from students. They appreciate the approach and the new understanding of the almightiness. One of the things you do in, in a number of your books is, is, is even to frame the question that, mm-hmm. uh, that kind of to to fray, to even frame the biblical narrative in a way the cross makes sense in it uh, is to is to look at uh, that that sin has been a problem throughout Scripture, but so has uh, Han and woundedness and, and and this kind of thing. How kind of describe how you see both the victim, the violator, uh, sin, and uh, and the suffering and the, and the wounds and the Han as as uh, integral to the biblical narrative. Because one of the things I've noticed as Protestants is um, it, it's not just Aquinas or, or Tertullian and the great chain of being that m- you know makes us have this image of divine perfection. It's also um, our understanding of justification that limits us from seeing 
um, scripture as as a story of God relating to peoples, addressing uh, a, a suffering exile, uh, in, enslavement, and all sorts of uh, systemic, powerful uh, problems. Mm, yeah. Thank you for the question. That's a very profound uh, question you raised that we have to really see the full spectrums of our scripture to understand the meaning of our sin. And there's no such a term as a Han in the Bible, but if you read it, it's a story about Han, lots of people. And Jesus healed people from one third, at least one third of his uh, ministry uh, was spent for healing and raising the downtrodden. So Jesus said, I came for sinners. When Jesus proclaimed, I came for sinners, those sinners, so-called sinners, was not really sinners. They were hand ridden people. For example, who were the sinners at that time? Shepherds. Why? Why shepherds were sinners? They couldn't attend the temple service. They, they couldn't keep the Sabbath holy. If they keep the Sabbath holy, what happened there to their flocks? <laughs> they were daily workers. They were daily workers. If you do not work, just so you cannot feed your family. So they have to break it. They were sinners. And also tenors. They were sinners. Why? They are dealing with a dead animal's skin, and they were smelly, so they were not allowed to enter the temple, not, not allowed to worship with others, and butchers. And these people were sinners, and tax collectors too. And they were really, some, sometimes they are real sinners by exploiting others. But a lot of people didn't have enough jobs, so they got the job. And that's the reason they were discriminated, discriminated against. And Jesus said, I came for them. So Jesus spent a lot of time with his hand ridden people. Prostitutes too. That time, women who couldn't support themselves, they are forced to prostitution. Think about it. Over 90% of the population lived in real poverty during Jesus' time. These people struggled. Jesus said, I came for them. They need me. That's the gospel, but we turned around, I think after the uh, Constantine the Great. Before Constantine the Great became Christians, pastors were very humble, bishops were very humble, and they really cared for the uh, downtrodden. But when he became Christian, the worship service changed social status of all the bishops and pastors. They have to perform before emperor. So they just uh, all care about these powerful leaders who are really sinners and oppressors. And so doctrines all just uh, along that line that developed for sinners. Mm -hmm. If you may sin, then you, know, you have to repent your sins, and after that, you will be justified. If you're justified, then you can be holy, sanctified, and then salvation. So, but if people are sinned against, then there's nothing uh, within the Christian church. Mm -hmm. Uh, early on, it, it, while you were talking, you kind of you brought up a certain, uh, you know, well, at least what process people talk about, uh, the fallacy of misplaced concreteness, uh, yeah. in that um, if you if you misdiagnose uh, what it is you're actually dealing with, then you can have all sorts of problematic things just flow right out of it. Uh, in in um, in therapy, people talk about the the myth. Uh, of the primary site where you come in for one issue and you're like this, this, and this, but the real issue is something else. Um, wow. And part of getting at it, I think has to do with the way you brought up a number of kind of three uh, pre theological intuitions or a certain awareness of uh, this unconscious 
powers that are running through the way we've received and interpreting the tradition. This, uh, the psychosomatic outcomes of Han existing generationally. You pointed out the um, hierarchy, patriarchy, and things that exist in the way our language uh, uh, around God uh, functions. Um, when we do this, you have this kind of fallacy of misplaced concreteness where then sin equals X, and now how you deal with X really is just dealing with guilt. And what it does is it, 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 it takes sin out of our our bodies, right? Like it takes salvation out of Sark's. It's no longer about us in community, entangled, uh, existing in, in, in culture, society, and politics, and all the different ways that shape our material existence. When, what I, what I, I, like, it's such a powerful idea, but I'm wondering um, for people who, who you've taught and engaged who don't have one, like a cultural touchstone like Han, or specific experiences that beg for that type of pre-theological intuition and awareness to be developed, uh, what are some ways of starting to attune ourselves to it so that our theological thinking, preaching, praying, and stuff don't kind of uh, avoid dealing with the real issues? Mm, thank you. Uh, I usually start with a church situation. On Sundays, most pastors preach on salvation. And so they have a formula. This is a Billy Graham formula. You are sinners, repent of your sins, and be saved. That's just a one formula. Most pastors use that simple formula. But let's give the example. On your pews, there are many sinners as well as a sin against. There are rapists, they can repent their sins, but they can be saved. So if they are raped, what would you say to them? The same message. We have only one formula. You are a sinner, repent of your sins, and then be saved. My brother-in-law, he is a new convert. He said, I was saved the last Sunday, but this pastor is repeating again, again, the same thing. He's a uh, Baptist. He said, is there something else? Now, we cannot really accommodate or we cannot really help the sinned against or abused with our uh, present theology. Maybe we can say, oh, if you are abused, please go to see a counselor. But I, I cannot help you as a preacher. That's uh, most people so, uh, respond to their parishioners. So I start from there, and we need something more than just one formula. That doesn't fit all. We have to create something else for sins against and their pain. Bible has all this uh, formulas for sins against, but we haven't used, we haven't developed. As I said, we have to really read the Bible very carefully. Also, read between lines. Mm -hmm. So we can see true heart of Jesus Christ. So yeah. in, in the same way that there are, are, are individuals in Scripture where if you took this prostitute or this shepherd or this person and said, oh, yeah, they're a sinner, clearly it applies to them because they've probably done something bad, then you miss yeah. like the entire systemic connections that put them in the situation, what holds them in the situation, and even the ways we've internalized uh, a, a logic of power that keeps people there. Uh, if we don't – right right in Scripture, we cut it out. In the same way, in our sermons and in our prayers, we, we, we have prayers of confession like the only problem is some sins we did or that the answer to an issue around shame where you're bearing a burden and things is really to be forgiven for it rather than uh, uh, to be healed. And that underneath it is, I, I find, a truly liberating for for conservative Christians. A lot of it is where internally you make yourself a victim because there's not a logic to explain it. And then for more progressive Christians, it actually gives you this robust uh, understanding of sin that addresses both personal sin and so social ones. It addresses our responsibility 
um, but it also gives us a model for moving forward where we're where we can actually um, think about what does transformation, reconciliation, and healing look like, and how can we participate in it? Because I feel like sin for some Christians is uh, rote, repetitive, and often burdensome. And for others, it's a doctrine or topic we run from because it just seems like the only option we have is that rather narrow or shallow version. I, when when we start to expand and look at it in this uh, the picture you've kind of opened up, I find it what one of the most powerful insights is that recognition that Han and the and you use the analogy of the black hole and things is not even just a human problem that for God it's a, it's about creation and it's about God's relationship to creation um and that we want to narrow the story down to individuals being forgiven but the notion of Han opens us up to seeing ourselves as social cells in societies. But it also opens up to see that the story of salvation, the story running through Scripture and God's relationship to the world is about all of Sark's, right? Like all material existence that God has brought into being versus just Soma. Um, like, can you describe that uh, God's – your understanding of God's relationship uh, to creation and activity in creation with this kind of deepened vision? Uh, uh, first of all, I will appreciate uh, your mentioning about this misplaced uh, conception. And that, uh, I think, is a very true. Uh, we misunderstand our understanding of uh, God's intention incarnation of that and so we have to think uh, uh, more big that we can see uh, God, God's creation would be fulfilled uh, God's uh, purpose uh, now and you, in the beginning you mentioned uh, something about this uh, guilt and shame and our understanding of our uh, uh, different doctrines. So if I forget, I want to mention that we, a lot of Protestants, focus on guilt a lot. Uh, someone asked this question to Ryan Hood If we are, we, are, we are all sinners, and is there any difference between the sin of uh, perpetrators and sin of the victim. So about the same, and Ryan Hunter Niebuhr uh, pondered, and he answered this way, yes, about the same. But what's the difference then? And he answered, there's a difference in their guilt. So he said, if you are sin sinner or perpetrator, then your guilt is higher than, deeper than the you are victim. But in terms of the level of a sin, we are all sinners, but what the sin. So he said this the equality of a sin and inequality of guilt. That's a his victim. That is a very deeply embedded in Protestantism, especially in evangelical understanding of the sin. We are all sinners. It doesn't matter whether you, you're rapist or raped. It doesn't matter you're murdered or murderer. Same, same level. There is a big problem with that kind of a theology. That's big all. And Jesus really attacked Pharisees and Sadducees, scribes, because your teaching was very one-sided. And go further. And as Jesus said, don't lead other people into the wrong direction. I'm not really accusing Ryan of the name. He's a, my hero. I respect him a lot. But because of a lack of a terminology, maybe, he couldn't think beyond that simple nature of a human beings. 
also he focused on sin alone in his uh, theological career. So that's understandable. But all of us are in, the, in that kind of a conundrum. We cannot really get out of this uh, simple understanding of our human beings. Of course, human beings are sinners, but there are the other side. We need uh, more than just uh, healing ourselves or repenting our sins. We have to have bigger vision of uh, accomplishing God's purpose of a creation, much bigger than just a salvation or even liberation, abundance of life. That's a very important and true uh, purpose of our creation I have given us. So for me, there is a real deep boy of a relationship in love, that's compassion, and in care, in also respect and uh, great uh, sharing. That, that's, I think, a much deeper dimension. We just focus on how to be saved, how to be healed. No, more than that, we have to really enjoy heavenly life, heavenly life on earth. Mm-hmm. Like that kingdom establishment as a purpose of our, all our theological efforts, structurally, also personally. Both. Now, uh, your last portion of a question is very important. Could you say a little more about your last well, portion? Yeah, I, I, I'm. I, I think it's important because I mean it's such a limited, uh, you know, time to kick it off. But one of the things that I think you do so powerfully in your work is recognize from this when you appropriate Han, then not only is there this story and depth and richness and interrelated image of our own need for healing as a species and as different peoples, but it also connects um, to God's identity, right? That God doesn't. God's identity is one who is redeemer and God is in the process of redeeming God's self in reconciling with us. Like there's that. And then you expand it all the way down to creation. And, and underneath that is both like our questions around ecological crisis and concerns, but also about God's identity as the one who is our hope and redeemer. And so I wonder if you could say, a, a, a bit about that kind of ecological and eschatological horizon um, when when the question of God's identity is deeply put into the mix. Mm, okay, thank you. Yeah, God created the universe not just uh, for making people struggle um, struggle with the sin and also healing alone. Jesus came down to save sinners, to liberate the sinned against or heal the sinned against, and also restore the purpose of God in creation. What is that? That's in Romans chapter 8, 18 following. The whole creation is groaning under that this uh, oppression of our uh, human beings. So all creation is groaning for liberation and healing, waiting upon the appearance of our children of God. I don't know where Paul got, got that idea, but I think that's a real picture of God's desire to create the whole uh, creation restored. Mm-hmm healed and redeemed. And so Jesus coming is not simply uh, anthropocentric. It's uh, deeper than that. And I think the gospel is uh, powerful in terms of uh, bringing down God's reign, God's kingdom on earth than simply people going to heaven uh, with their spirit. That this God God, uh, cares about ecology, environment, and also beyond uh, this, uh, any kind of a narrow understanding of a salvation of a one nation. There was a one mistake of, a, I think, a Jewish nation in the past. God cared about them alone, not others. 
And but God said, you are the light of all other nations. So you have a message to reach out our other nations. That was a mission of Israel. Exactly the same way. God is calling us. Jesus is calling us to baptize people and make them disciples and make this earth God's way, God's kingdom. And we do not really focus on that at all. And so it's time to think bigger, uh, bigger, uh, more uh, inclusively Mm -hmm. in our lives. So one of the questions, um, uh, and it's more kind of connecting the dots from a number of the things you said, and then seeing if I if I heard it right, because it's it's actually connected to uh, something I'm working on in specifically dialogue with your work in Moltmann. Um mm-hmm. And so it, early on in in challenging the divine attributes, you lifted up uh, two culprits that have snuck in silently into. Um, uh, Christian theology, Stoicism, who takes the understanding of the Logos um, mm-hmm. and then uh, has perfection attached to it as, as that which isn't even suffering. That God, the perfection involves apathy. Uh, and then you talked about Gnosticism, which has a strong dualism, which uses the concept of Logos and Sophia, um, but in doing so critiques, uh, cre- dismisses our embodiedness, our cre- our created material identity that the God of Israel made, named good, and is in the business of redeeming. And so when you turn towards both uh, the incarnation and the cross, uh, it it seems to me, especially in the way you read the Gospel of John, that um, you are, in a sense, protesting um, the uh, – Tertullian, Constantinian understanding of Logos Christology with uh, re-Christianizing it, um, in a sense, so that the Word of God, the Word and wisdom of God, the Logos and Sophia, um, is defined by the cross. So the, the, the cross, the Word of God is the cross where, where suffering, participation, and all these things are true and that God's invested in, 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 in it. But the cross is also the word of God and that God's identity can't be understood apart from God's participation and sharing uh, in these things. And when you take that notion that the word of God is not only God's incarnating in the sarks of things, all createdness, but that the word of God is also the cross, then it, it kind of helps make sense of the the reading of the I am uh, statement that you brought up in John, because there the... Uh, like when is the word finished in the Gospel of John? It's finished on the cross. So the the word of God is uh, is made sarks, and the entire Gospel through John, you have this notion of when when is it done? When the when the sun is lifted up, when the word is made flesh, when's it done? It's on the cross. That's where in the Gospel of John, Jesus says it is finished. Mm. And to me, those the the if Sarks and the cross define uh, the wisdom and word of God, then we can't talk about the truthfulness of God without recognizing that God is both the cross bearer and not the cross builder, and that God has identified with the sinned against on behalf of and with the sinners and. Mm-hmm in that dynamism that's at the heart of what you're saying, it becomes this kind of robust Christo cruciform, I don't know, Johannine Christology. Yeah. Very good. You're preaching. Thank you. (laughs) 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 Yeah. That's a very true that, uh, that Jesus crucifixion was not just a, a sinner's, uh, suffering. We, we just always connect the sinner's suffering as uh, Jesus' uh, work on the cross. Much more than that, Jesus was a victim, really mm-hmm. truly a victim of our social system and also that rejection of people uh, and also literal interpretation of the Bible. And they, they thought that he cannot be the Messiah because when Messiah comes, you know, Messiah is going to have a power. Right? Just, uh, and reject and defeat enemies and establish the Davidic kingdom. That's just a very literal interpretation. 
Even nowadays, people wait for that. That's why my Jewish friends, when I talk to them and they said, we like to really accept Jesus as a, our Messiah, but we cannot. One of them is uh, Martin Buber. Uh, of course, he was not my friend, but he said this to many Christians. I respect Jesus Christ. I really want to take him as our Messiah. But when Messiah comes, there will be peace, shalom everywhere. But I did not see it. So I, there's no way I can confess Jesus as a Messiah. My friend, Mark, over here, the right state, he's teaching uh, Jewish theology. He said that too. When I said that Jesus, you treat Jesus as a Messiah, but as a false Messiah, he said, yes, Jesus is a false Messiah. Many people cannot accept Jesus as a Messiah. Why? Their understanding of a cross is very similar to those people who rejected Jesus Christ. So Jesus, the powerfulness or powerlessness was a real issue for them. And also Jesus as a victim uh, rather than conqueror is a real issue for them. And they, they cannot accept Jesus as a messiah. And so I want to see a real concrete picture of uh, God's image that is shown on the cross. That cross represents for, 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 for me and real core of a Christian doctrine of God and doctrine of a reconciliation. That there, God is crying out to God and God is uh, really uh, making up together uh, with a recon with a whole creation. And, and I think that's an answer to God's uh, promise to Noah. Uh, I think most people are familiar with the Noahic covenant. And when God showed the rainbows, this is uh, Genesis chapter 9, the rainbow represents God's promise to not only Noah and Noah's family, but those animals creatures that were with uh, Noah. Mm -hmm. So I promise I will not destroy all creation at all. And that rainbow promise was fulfilled on the cross. And Jesus' death is more than just a salvation of a human beings mm -hmm. and a restoration of a relationships of all beings, victims and also perpetrators any kind. So when we human beings uh, really abuse uh, other creatures and nature, uh, we are simple. We have to repent and turn around. And we really have to respect God's desire to care about all these creatures, not only human beings alone. So it is a restoration of a relationship, broken relationships happen at the cross. That's the Ephesians chapter six, horse understanding. Uh, one of the things that popped in my mind in connecting those two thoughts is that uh, in the incarnation, the uh, you have um, cosmological entanglement being connected to God, and on the cross you have a soteriological entanglement um, connected to God, and. In, in part of that insists that like healing, salvation, restoration, reconciliation is not something where anyone's left out. It's something that God's invested in uh, for each person in our like multi connected ways. Like there are places in which every person is both the oppressor and the oppressed and in different ways. And Han lingers and families and cultures in all sorts of different places. And one of the beautiful things I find in, in, in your description, in this kind of soteriological entanglement that God has put God's self in on our behalf, is is it kind of is a it's a release valve for us having to find the responsible one and fix it, right? Like it, it, it's a release valve so that we can then um, give the other dignity and seek out to understand each other and in, in the way the the bondage and oppression and things of sin are affecting them share where it is with us and 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 actually have conversations 
where the expectation is mutual reconciliation uh, versus a kind of, um, uh, you know, you're, you're the problem or you're the problem or you're this, so that means you're this. Uh, can, can you say a bit about that? Because I know that um, one of the things that you've done, and we've talked about it other times on the podcast, is take uh, like these images of Han and things and actually uh, help uh, uh, Christians, lay people and stuff process dealing with, with their particular stories and the people that they're in relationship. How can you describe this image as actually helping us think through moving to to becoming more peace in our lives and reconciled with our neighbors and family in our past? Hmm. Uh, you know, right now I'm working on the uh, death experience and heaven and hell. And I, I'm sorry I didn't have uh, any time to deal with the living God aspect. For me, it's a very important thing is this. We have to really see we are, you know, penetrated and we are really, you know, connected. And we actually do not know our identities unless we understand the God in us, God with us. And God created us as a human family. So it, it is a, we have to really uh, distinguish sinners and the sinned against, but actually sinned against are sinners too. And so we have to see the bigger picture, how we can reconcile through the cross. So here is a cross. I use this uh, triangle, triangle example. Here is a Jesus. And when we love Jesus together, we become closer together. So God and Jesus Christ, the Trinity, is on top. And by understanding or by living out that God in our daily life, true reconciliation happens, true repentance happens, true, recon- true uh, healing takes place there. And so without right understanding about Jesus and God, it is very difficult to have a full uh, restoration of a relationship and God's presence in our life. Before I forget, uh, I have to mention this. Jesus is the face of God. A lot of people think I have a little trouble with this, this uh, social understanding of a trinity. And they think there are three beings. But no, it's not, there are not three beings, only one. People, this is the mystic's testimonies. After this life, they like to see three beings sitting on, sitting on three different thrones. So... God, and then Jesus on my side, and the Holy Spirit left side. And they want to see God. They are all disappointed when they couldn't see God in the, after this life. And they are taught and we instructed, we educated. God is a spirit. You cannot see God forever. And they are frustrated. <laughs> Why can't we see God? That's the reason God became human being to communicate with us. So Jesus is truly representative of God, and Jesus is God. And without Jesus, there's no way we can see the image of God. And that is an important uh, aspect of uh, our conversation now. Without that understanding, Jesus' incarnation and life, resurrection, and salvation and healing, all this cannot be understood right. Jesus came to really bring down Jesus' uh, kingdom on earth for us. And we're going to really establish Jesus' reign on earth. And that's going to continue I think, uh, after even this life. I believe the next life. So that's uh, my understanding of the theology. Theology is not really study about God. I think that's a, a misleading term theology. Theologos. 
and origin and other people try to avoid that term because it has a sort of smell of narcissism and studying and um, speculating. It is a more living out, living God. So that's uh, what we are doing here. So we, we have to uh, see uh, God living within us, how to uh, make us repent every day. That's evangelical repentance for wrestling. And on the other hand, we have to forgive others every day. And we are all just uh, enmeshed in this uh, uh, cosmic tapestry of the salvation and liberation here. Mm-hmm. Um, we just have a little bit of time, and there are three topics, and I'll may just name them, and you can say whatever you want about them rather than asking uh, specific questions because uh, one of the goals for for the for these calls is to hear even how different theologians thra- uh, frame addressing different topics. Um, and, and so the, the first one is kind of how does your understanding of God and the stuff we've talked about uh, frame uh, your understanding of of uh, a political systemic engagement for the, the church and the shape of discipleship. Mm-hmm. Yeah. The discipleship in political engagement, is that what you're asking? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's a very practical question. Uh, right now, my present struggle is this been teaching theology for a long time and I see churches are dying and I see people are just uh, quite disappointed at the church and disappointed at theology too. A lot of people do not take theology seriously in the church and they go for all this uh, uh, what we call the charismatic leaders uh, charismatic side of a church. So I'm kind of a charismatic, and I try to see how we can be real effective disciples by seeing that charismatic movement restored with a social gospel and practice to, to do together with the power of God occupying us. And with, with that, we can do real Discipleship and discipleship of transforming structural evil of society. Mm-hmm. Without that, if we do, we experience burnout. Social justice is very important. But without this receiving true uh, source of power or energy from above, and we just want to do by our own effort, we cannot be true disciples. That's why waiting is very important. Waiting upon God. That was my uh, original intention of talking about the living God. Mm-hmm. And hearing the voice of God is very important. We do not just act our own. We have to hear real voice of God. In the past, I never thought about that at all. Hearing voice of God is a necessary part of a discipleship. By hearing, we can really go out and do God's will very concretely. Not my own thinking. It's not my own kingdom I want to ever establish or my understanding of God's kingdom. It's God's kingdom. To build God's kingdom, I have to hear the shepherd's voice. Jesus said, my sheep hear my voice. So it's important for hearing the voice of God. So prayer life is connected to this discipleship. Every day for me is a real challenge. Pray and then pause to listen to the voice of God. Mm-hmm. I can talk a lot of time maybe about that, but it's a very important for me. Holy Spirit presence and Jesus is leading into the society with that uh, uh, or presence of our Holy When uh, when you have a, um, a, a an understanding of God, where divine action. Um, isn't on the terms of omnipotence. Um, how do you understand uh, God's 
d- ability to act? Like, how would you describe divine action without omnipotence, or maybe how God engages in things like uh, uh, responds to prayer, uh, miracles, these type of things? Uh, there's been a number of questions that have come in, and they're really around, like, does God do anything the moment God's not omnipotent? Mm. Uh, personally, I believe God is omnipotent, uh, all powerful, uh, as I mentioned in my presentation. God is all powerful in love, in compassion, in truthfulness. So I do not believe uh, God is uh, limited uh, in, in this. So that's more urgent issue than God can do this or that. And for me, if God is uh, almighty, I can give my heart. And why? Because God is love, not because of God's power. That's, uh, again, power worship and wrong power. So if God has a, uh, that kind of a essential truth of the whole universe, then you know, I, can, I can do anything in God. And this is an outcry of our near-death experiencers. When they died and they realized nothing is important in this world, the only thing is unconditional love of God. How we practice that, how we live that out in human relationship, in any relationship we're going to have. And so for me, that's related to discipleship. And that's also... Uh, carrying out our social responsibility in daily life. Everything is not my centered, but God centered, Christ centered, uh, time spending and living out uh, discipleship. Well, one of the things that might be helpful in just that, because like even the way you've redefined certain words could make, uh, could get kind of ideas confused among uh, some of the listeners. So, uh, last time when we talked to Roger Olson, uh, you know, he was drawing very strict distinctions between kind of uh, process and, and traditional thinkers and then open theists uh, and, and trying to to kind of carve out his location. For him, the the greatness of God, uh, like he needed God's power uh, to preserve kind of perfect eschatological confidence. That was – uh, the issue that kept him from kind of modifying divine power to a certain extent. Um, what I hear you doing, and you can tell me if this is correct, is that when our understanding of power and its perfections defined by the God who was in Christ, then we reframe the way we would even ask the question, right? Because most of the time when we're debating divine power, it's that first type of power uh, Bernie Loomer's describing, or it's power as the Stoics would like it or the Gnostics would like it, as opposed to having our language, the meaning of our theological vocabulary determined by God's self-testimony in Christ, um, uh, life, death, resurrection, and such. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think you, you said it quite well, and I fully agree with you And as Catholicism. And also, you are, I, I think you are saying uh, something about as as catalogical uh, content and well, that a lot of our friends in the open and relational theology group, um, when they argue about divine power, some argue about oh, creation out of nothing or creation out of uh, uh, the deep or creation out of love. Others, when they talk about divine power, will argue about eschatological confidence, where you'll have like the social trinitarians via Moltmann, Pontenberg, where these the proleptic event. You'll have others that are like the open theist who have a God self-limited until God needs to pull out the trump card for eschatological assurance. And the process people are like, y'all are really concerned about stuff we don't even know much about. Um, and you're once you start having God change the rules of God's relationship to the world, there's going to be a lot of moms with dead kids that go, couldn't you have changed it earlier? Like if you were going to reconcile everything, maybe like before the Holocaust, before the genocide here, before, you know. So one of the things that's real frustrating with that, I think, is that then we draw battle lines, but the definition of power underneath it is still like the Greco-Roman philosophical one. And one of the things that I heard you doing is going, 
Nope. Before we decide what God's power is or what almighty means or what any of these are, can we at least let God tell us what power looks like? And it's in what Jesus said, did and endured, not in uh, stoicism or or whatever. Right. Uh, that, that is a very important uh, statement and also an issue you are raising. And that's uh, precisely right. That's what I was going to articulate. Our understanding of almightiness or power, our understanding of eschatological end. I know just uh, right now I'm working on this issue too. Universalism or, uh, excuse me, I have to turn this up. Universalism or uh, the, the non universalism. How are we going to end our life and how God created the universe? And I've I like uh, actually uh, to see what God's own saying about all this than my own understanding. So I know uh, this is an issue between Morton, uh, Han Nimble and John Carr. So John Carr is a, eschaton, eschaton is open, Han Nimble is not. A lot of people, including universalists, they do not believe any kind of openness in the future. But I see that openness in the future very clearly because that's a God's desire. We do not see that uh, any kind of a restriction of our God against our freedom. God respect our freedom all the way. That's the reason we have a heaven and hell. We choose our destinies and also our creation too. A lot of people think creation is out of nothing or is it a bionic? or organic, absolute nothingness, or relative nothingness. And it's all from God. Everything is from God, from my perspective. And mystics are all just come to that. Whole universe is out of God's self. And I think I like that. It's not out of anything but God's self. Mm -hmm. So we are uh, in God, uh, in, in creation, also in eschaton, even hell is not outside of God. It's within God's grace. So we uh, may have our own theology, but I hope theology doesn't determine our future, God's will, mm -hmm. God's guidance, God's law. That's my, my understanding. Well, thank you so much for taking the time to join us. And uh, and answer the questions and share um, uh, at the beginning and putting so much effort into preparing such a clear, thoughtful, and inspiring thoughts. Um, uh, but is there is there any final words or anything that I should have asked, should have thought of, or, or, or provoked you to say that you'd like to share uh, as we close out? Uh, I I hope uh, that we develop new type of a theological education. Speaking to the church, speaking to uh, injured, downtrodden, wounded, as well as uh, uh, injurers or perpetrators or sinners. So churches should be real, not just a, a one-sided or progressive or conservative or evangelical. It's just a church should be one in terms of uh, understanding as well as uh, practicing. But I do not really go for understanding science because there's so much argument. We have to really live out God as I un we understand. Mm -hmm. Then there will be, will be future for God's body. This is a, we, we are really body of a Christ. And I really hope the Christianity will experience something very new. Through theological transformation, that's uh, Phil Clayton's too. I know his heart. And we have to have a new theology and something, something true and genuine to everybody. Everybody can own, everybody can appreciate, and also have a longer uh, dialogue with each other. And I saw, I do not see any kind of uh, boundaries that going to create the walls between churches. We go beyond the denominations, 
our trend and also our thinking is very limited. We accept that and even though people have a different opinions, we still embrace each other in Christ. Mm-hmm. Well, thank you so much. That is a very encouraging word. I know I I personally am very invested in helping uh, the church uh, cross boundaries, be it uh, theological ones, be it raise uh, the the uh, conversation and and even the inputs to it. Because I think that uh, like even uh, what you've shared today is the perfect beginning place for conversations where where people, if you just checked your answers to certain questions about God, it, it would be hard to get everyone in the room. But I think we can all recognize that uh, if God was revealed in Jesus, it, it, then the church should be a place where we can be honest about our wounds and that the community should be a place of uh, uh, of healing for them. And um, given that everyone's human, I think that's a, a, a great place for us to uh, start to build some unity. Yeah. Also, I have a one last comment for pastors. Always focus on wounds, injuries and pain, suffering, harm of our congregations when they prepare their sermons. Mm-hmm. Then I think that they will not go far too far out from the, the need of, uh, of the church congregation. Yeah. So the, if, you, if, if you join in the middle of it, this is Andrew Sung Park. Uh, make sure you, you go check out uh, some of his books um, I mentioned earlier. Uh, Triune Atonement, which is both a survey and an interpretation of the doctrine uh, uh, of atonement in the Trinity, and uh, From Hurt to Healing. That's one of my favorites, but uh, you know, Amazon could tell you about all of them. Um, if you go to enfoldingtheology.com, you'll find out about the next six uh, sessions like this and the interactive event the first week of March at, here in uh, California. Uh, next week, uh, if, if you are a nerd, this is a super treat. Uh, Schubert Ogden's going to be on. He's the author of uh, the, the Reality of God and Other Essays, uh, The Point of Christology, Faith and Freedom Towards the Theology of Liberation, and a, and a whole host of uh, of other texts. But The Reality of God and Other, es- and other Essays th- is one of the more influential books in kind of the larger open and relational uh, philosophical and theological discussions. Um, and he, next week, will actually be wrestling with how the question of God crosses uh, uh, boundaries in and it's a theological question, it's a philosophical question, and how you answer it changes based on how you understand your philosophical understanding of religion. So we will have a, a, a wonderful time, and it, it, he's he doesn't speak very often, he, he he's retired, um, but he has inspired tons of thinkers, so it's going to be a real, real treat to get to hear from him, and uh, if you've never heard from him before, you ha- you should do it, because if you have... That you're going to be excited. The other thing is, I was told that um, it, we might even get uh, personal, like it, the question and answer, and y'all should all ask. Tell us about your favorite time hanging out with Boltman and Heidegger. See, that's a story you don't like. How many people alive get to tell that? You know, at one time I was hanging out with Boltman and Heidegger story. So that, that's that's the other goal for next week. Um. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Park, and I hope you have an excellent afternoon. You too. Thank you.